Hello everyone and welcome to the Study in the UK 10 British Phrases That You Need to Know session. Uh, my name is Joey Kirk. I am the Education Officer at the British Council based out of the British Embassy in Washington DC. Um, so today we're going to talk about 10 British phrases that you would need to know whilst studying in the UK. Um, and scattered in between we're also going to talk about a few of the things you need to know about the education system, how to apply, um, and just how it's run, just to give you an overall idea of what education in the UK is like. So once again, just to reiterate, my name is Joey Kirk um, from the British Council. If you have any questions, please type them into your question box and ask away. I'll be happy to answer them. I'll try to answer throughout the presentation. Um, however, if I find that the question is going to be answered later in the presentation. I'll try and wait until then. So once again, just feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer. Um, I will try to be as uh, informal over a webinar as possible. So um, sit back um, and let's hope you learn some phrases. Okay, so the first phrase, um, I guess I should preface this that as you can tell, I am American. Uh, I've been working at the embassy for a bit over two years now um, and have had a lot of experience in the UK. So these are phrases that we use around the office that I know university students in the UK use um, and just the average Brit will say it on the street. So trust me, they are true. I, I will give you examples throughout of how to use them um, and just to really reiterate that this is, these are 100% these are accurate and they are used quite frequently. All right, so the first being, you all right? So, you all right? Uh, what this is really trying to get across is, are you okay? Um, it's kind of like how we would stay in the, stay in the States, how are you doing? Um, in reality, we're not looking for someone to come back and tell us all about their day, like, well, it's been rough, it's this happened. No, you all right, it's very simple, like, oh, you're all right? Yeah, you're all right, great. And then you move on from there. It's kind of an opener to a conversation. So, hope you're all right, fantastic. So I'm gonna go right into the next phrase as well. Uh, and the next phrase is brilliant. So as you can tell, this is all working, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, brilliant is used all too frequently in the UK, um, and it's used in a lot of different contexts. Um, when something goes well, brilliant. Uh, and then they'll use it in a lot of um, slang ways as, as well. From In Scotland, they'll say, say things like pure dead brilliant. That's absolutely pure dead brilliant. Um, in Northern England, they'll say brill. Uh, so they'll shorten it a bit, so it's B-R-I-L-L, -L, so Brill, which we say a fair amount in the office here, like, okay, Brill. Um, and then I know even in some London Cockney, they'll say Brillo pads, things like that. So Brilliant is used in every which way, um, every possible way. So be prepared to say Brilliant quite a bit while you're in the UK. So if you are looking to the UK, there's probably one reason that you might be looking there, and it's heritage. So heritage is great in the UK. You find there are um, some of the natural wonders of the world are there, as well as just some of the oldest and most fantastic universities um, really building into why this science behind me, the uh, education is great. Okay, so we're going to go a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today whilst we speak the British phrases and I, I try to teach them to you. Um, so we're going to talk about UK institutions and undergraduate degrees in the UK um, because there are a lot, there's a lot of explaining to make it uh, really translate to the US system just for a simple explanation. We'll talk a little bit about admissions and how to get into a UK institution. Then we'll talk about funding your British education, immigration, so and how to get a visa. And lastly, I'll open it up for questions. But once again, if you have them throughout, just shout them out. I'm happy to answer. Okay, so the UK itself has over 300 institutions offering degree programs. And they offer varying levels of degree programs similar to the US and our institutions. So where in the US we have over 4,000 institutions, the UK is a lot smaller, so just 300. Um, and they are split into universities, but there are about 160 universities. Um, then university colleges were a bit smaller. Specialist institutions, which consist of arts conservatoires, performing arts academies, that type of thing. And then colleges, which are further education colleges, which are very vocationally driven. Um, so they fall into those four categories. So it's 300 plus institutions. There are a, quite a few to choose from. You'll definitely find the right one for you. There was one private university, we're now up to three. So the government is starting to allow more private universities into the UK. Um, so there are just three. Um, to talk a little bit about the system and 
how it works. England, Wales, and Northern Ireland are, operate under a uh, 13 plus 3 system. So what that means is primary and secondary school take 13 years in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and then three years for a university degree. So you can get your bachelor's degree in just three years while you're in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Scotland operates under a similar system to the US, that's 12 years for primary and secondary school, and then four years for university. So you'll graduate with your MA, actually, from the Scottish institution after four years. So both are undergraduate degrees in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, three years, Scotland, four years. All right, brilliant, okay, so, uh, First, and now that we've started, let me just say I'm absolutely chuffed to have you with me. Um, chuffed is means uh, really excited and just and just happy to be here. So I, I'm quite chuffed to have you with me. And thanks for thanks for being here. And I hope you're going to learn quite a bit. Um, this phrase is used when someone's really, really, I guess, excited um, that they're or or really like, passionate about something. I'm absolutely chuffed. So I'm, I'm chuffed to be here. So thank you guys. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about undergraduate degrees. So they really run the gamut in the UK. You can major in anything from acting to zoology. There is literally everything um, on offer. So you can definitely find program that you're looking for. The programs are highly focused, so they're very specialized. And, and what I mean by that is they, they're not your typical US program. You, en you don't enter into general education curriculum. You enter directly into your major and you stick with that throughout. Um, so you're, if you major in English, you're not going to have to do anything really but English. You'll never have to take a science, a math class, any of that. Um, if you, however, if you major in biology, for instance, you're going to take almost entirely biology. You're never going to take history, English, or language requirement, none of that. It's very, very focused. Um, and with that focus, there comes a lot of independent scholarship and critical thinking. Um, so the student ends up doing a lot of work outside of the classroom. So they do things within their modules, which are their classes. Um, so you'll learn a lot in your modules and your lecture theaters. However, um, a lot is done by the student themselves. So what you'll do is you'll do this, a lot of independent learning, a lot of reading on your own, and then producing um, papers for your professors. Um, in the UK, most degrees are honors degrees. So unlike the US, where there's honors colleges within universities, in U the UK, there's most of the programs are honors automatically. So you'd be graduating with an honors degree, um, so, which means just higher level classes. It's really, it'd be quite an intense education, but those three years, you will learn quite a lot and come back very knowledgeable on your subject matter. Um, as I mentioned, there are no gen ed requirements, so you enter directly into your course. Um, the program duration does vary, as I mentioned, with three years in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, four years in Scotland. You can also do four years in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland if you choose to do a sandwich program, which I'll talk about in a bit. And yes, you heard that correctly, sandwich program. So the next one is, let's have a think. Where can you actually get this information about the UK and this phrase? So let's have a think. It's not let's think about it. It's let's have a think. Um, in the UK, they use have as opposed to let's do something. It's let's have something. So let's have a think about this. Where Does anyone know where they can get a lot of information just about universities in the UK? Anyone? So the best place, the one-stop shop to get information in the UK is on this website, educationuk.org slash USA. So educationuk.org is a website that we, the British Council, manage. Um, and with it, it is actually a government-funded website. So it's all done through the, the British government has made this happen. Um, Education UK is the student-facing brand for all international students interested in the UK. So on the Education UK website, which was recently re relaunched this summer, you will find everything you need to know about the UK, from student life, to sports activities, to you know, clubs and societies, to every major listed, so you can look to see, well, if I want to study you know, biomedicinal chemistry, which universities have that? Once you find that, you can look into, all right, I want to be in a city, all right, you can hammer down a little bit further, and then keep going until you find the university that's right for you, looking up fees, all of that. It's all, all very doable on this free resource, educationuk.org slash USA. All right, so the next bit, um, it's a bit wonky. 
the UK system initially. Uh, wonky meaning strange or like off kilter. Uh, a, a table can be a bit wonky if it you know rocks back and forth. Um, but the system may appear a bit wonky in the, in the sense that it's strange to us uh, Americans. However, it really isn't and it makes perfect sense. You just have to get to know it a little. So let me talk a little bit about program types. Um, so the program types are broken down into these real four things you can see below. There's the single honors program, which is a one subject major. So it's in term in US um, speak. So this one, as you can see, this example is a BSc ons in human geography. So it's an honors bachelor's of science in human geography. Um, and with this, so it's very focused. And this is what most students who go to the UK do. They do a single honors degree. Um, so they really focus on that one subject. You can also do interdisciplinary um, degrees, which you can do like a BA in humanities, for instance. So you can study more general, a general curriculum if you're not exactly sure what you want to do. But if you know exactly what you do, it's perfect to do the single honors program. There's also combined and joint honors. And this would be, I think, make a lot of sense to our American audience, uh, is that it's like a double major or a major and minor. So a combined honor, a combined honors is two different degrees that you're doing equally. So BSc Ons in Biomedicinal Chemistry and Music, for instance. So they're not the most similar of subjects, which can be quite difficult to do. It's usually easier to do this um, when they're similar subjects, say if you're doing you know, um, a joint honors in English and poetry or something. That can work a lot, a lot better, a lot easier. Um, but this example, biomed Biomedicinal Chemistry and Music, it's doable. You can see that it's a combined honors um, a ra rather a, like a double major in that way because it says and. So if it says and, it's like a double major. Um, when it says with, it's like a major minor. So you can see the LLB, which is a um, undergraduate law degree, and LLB on in law with criminology um, is kind of the major minor. So you're focusing on law, but then you have criminology also in your coursework. Lastly, professional degrees are available and the undergraduate level in the UK. And these include all those listed below, so medicine, dentistry, law, architecture, business, um, all very focused. So you can enter directly into a medicine program. It is very difficult, but it is doable. I just mentioned the law degree. It's, so it's a three-year undergraduate law degree. You come back to the US after three years and you can sit for the bar exam. So as opposed to doing four years undergraduate, then three years and in law school in the US, you could do three years undergraduate law in the UK and then come back and sit for the bar exam. Um, and just some more examples, uh, veterinary is another option, a professional degree where you can do an undergraduate um, veterinary degree and come back. There are many dual accredited programs uh, between the UK and the US that you could come back and then be a practicing vet. So here's an example of what a single honors program looks like. And this is a single honors in history. Um, and just so you can see, it is very focused. From the, from the get-go, your, your modules are pretty much assigned in terms of what, if you, once you choose your course. So you're going to be doing something very, very specific. Um, what I really want to point out on this slide is the dissertation in your third year. So your third year, the dissertation is really, really important, and it takes up actually a lot of your second half of your final year because this is required for graduation. Um, and programs do vary in what they require if it's, you know, a really um, long paper or if it's some sort of, um, if you're working in some sort of performing media arts, it'll be some sort of uh, project or program. So it, it does vary depending on what your course is, but it is very much, very important in your final year. And then I mentioned that sandwich program earlier. So this one coming up right now is the sandwich program. Um, and this is a, a sandwich program with uh, BSc honors in marketing. So as you can see, still very focused. You can still see in the final year, there's that dissertation at the end. But in year three, that sandwich program is actually like a co-op program in terms of um, US language. So it's a work placement year. So with that, most UK universities who offer work placements really try to get work to get paid for work placements. So you would get be getting paid whilst working full time during university. You'll pay the university a nominal fee just to maintain your you know spot on campus. Um, but you'll have you'll be working full time within your field of study. So this person in marketing would be at some sort of marketing agency or firm 
working at a, at a, a regular job to really try out their field while still a student. All right, so countryside is great. Just another, I just wanna keep on showing you pictures of what the UK is. It really is a gorgeous, absolutely stunning, stunning country um, where you can see oh, many, many different things. And there are universities really scattered throughout. It is bigger than just London. So you'll be able to see things all over the place. So just keep an eye out because, um, and it is such a small country that it's very easy to travel in. The trains work absolutely brilliantly. So you'll be able to get anywhere quite quickly. All right, our next phrase is that's ace or that's rubbish. Um, and these you'll be using um, out and about or you know, if you're hanging with friends and they do something, you'll be like, oh, that's ace, which means like, that's awesome. That is so cool, that's ace. That's rubbish is kind of saying like, oh, that's terrible. Ah, oh, that's not good. I don't want that, that's rubbish. Um, so that's, that's basically, so it's like, you know, that's ace and that's rubbish. Um, so, and that's ace is saying like, exactly perfect, all right? So that's ace or that's rubbish. Um, and this, the reason I put this phrase here is because our, our next stop on our tour of the UK university system is beyond the degree. And you might say that that's ace or that's rubbish because there's a lot of different things you can do. There are things you'll like and there are things you might not want to be a part of. Um, there are lots of different um, student life and leadership opportunities you can be part of. Every university has a students union run by the students for the students. It's wonderful, wonderful. It's it's where all the kind of the social activity focuses around. Um, and in here you'll find all the different societies and clubs, the athletic clubs and societies, student volunteers, all sorts of things. Um, society and clubs are just like our you know, clubs and activities at a, at a US institution. So you can find any, everything from you know, model sailboat racing, because it exists at some universities if you want it to exist. If you get enough people to sign a petition, it can, um, to uh, wine and cheese club is on most campuses, you'll find like rugby teams, you'll find rowing, fitness, you'll find it all. Um, they really run the gamut. So you can do just about anything on your university campus. Um, and then beyond the degree, it's also worth mentioning, I mentioned the sandwich program, but work and employability. You can get a work placement on campus. So under your student visa, which I'll talk about later, you can work part time during term. So you can work up to 20 hours per week. Uh, which is a good way to make money while still um, while still being a student. And there are also often spring and summer work placements that your career services um, will help you find um, should you choose. And because I've mentioned uh, athletics clubs, it's, it's worth mentioning what the UK is known for: football. Um, so soccer in the US, but football is gigantic in the UK and I'm sure you'll make your way to some a Premier League match somewhere at some point during your three-year or four-year experience. Okay, so the next step is UCAS. And UCAS is the organization responsible for connecting people to the higher education institutions. So it's the universities and college colleges admissions service. And so UCAS is actually the central application for students. It's one application for up to five different courses. So you can apply to multiple courses at one institution. You can apply to, you know, one, one course at each institution. It's really up to you. Um, and everything can be done online at UCAS.com. Okay, so when to apply. And these are the important things, just so you know. Okay, so September 1st is when the UCAS application actually opens. So you can actually start filling out your application. So it's the first day you, well, rather, it opens in the summer. The first day you can submit your application um, is September 1st. October 15th is the deadline for some of those pre-professional programs I met, mentioned, like medicine, veterinary, and dentistry. Um, you have to turn in your application by October 15th. It's also worth mentioning, if you're applying to any of those degrees, you can only apply to four of them out of your five that you're applying to. The fifth one would have to be another subject. So if you apply to four medicine programs, the last one maybe you'll apply to would be biomedicinal chemistry. So something that is medicine related, but just in case you're not accepted into the program, because it is quite difficult, especially as an American or any international student, to enter a medicine program. They often only have between 10 and 15 places for international students representing the whole world. So there are a lot of applications getting there just for medicine. Um, and then also on October 15th 
is the Oxford and Cambridge deadlines. So it's just to push, put it out there, it's Oxford or Cambridge. You cannot apply to both. You need to choose one. So Oxford or Cambridge, you have to really choose um, the one. I would advise if you plan to a plan to apply to Oxford or Cambridge to to apply early. So try to try to apply by early September to get everything submitted, because with that you have to interview for Oxford or Cambridge um, in order to be accepted. So and they they make you come to the UK for those interviews. However, I know both Oxford and Cambridge do come to the US um, in late September to do some interviews. So they typically do them in the New York area. So it might be cheaper for you to get to New York than it would be to go all the way to the UK just for that interview. Um, the other one, the next, the other deadlines are January 15th. So this is the big advisory application deadline. So what this is, is where students have to, um, I would suggest get your application in by. So this, you enter the, the same pool as all of the other students come January 15th. Um, they'll have already started making decisions at this point, but if you're not in that first grouping, you won't receive, you, you will have to, you'll, you'll be reviewed after everyone else who's already applied from the fall through January 15th. So you're kind of last in line at that point. Um, and they might offer to a, a, a place to a student who submitted earlier, whose grades might not be as good as yours because they submitted earlier, so just so you're aware. Um, March 24th is where many of the art and design courses, their deadlines. Um, so you have to check each course for the deadline, but it's typically around the March 24th um, time. And with that is you have to submit your portfolios and things for art and design. And lastly, all applications after submitted after June 30th enter are, are held um, for clearing. And clearing is something that happens in late summer when universities try to fill final spots they have. Um, so they can fill the programs that haven't filled. So if you, you know, you might get brought up to a, a higher tier university, or you might find you might be able to go somewhere else if you weren't successful in your other applications. All right, we're on to our next phrase, which is "don't have a strop." Um, I know the UCAS application seems intense, but don't strop. Don't have a strop. It's not worth it. Having a strop is uh, kind of like throwing your hands up in the air and be like, "Oh God, I hate this." Kind of having a strop, and we don't want you to have one of those. Trust me, it's not that hard. It's pretty easy. It just takes a little bit of getting to know. So don't have a strop. It will be okay. The UCAS application itself consists of six sections, and they include personal details, obviously. So you have to submit your name, your email, your address, all of that stuff. Um, student finance, which you really don't have to fill out as an American student. Um, there's less worry about being able to pay for tuition for Americans. Choices, so the universities you're interested in applying to, so the courses you want to apply to. Um, education, so this is your education background. So if you're in high school, it'll say this high school, GPA, and you submit your transcript. Employment, um, employment is you know if you've been working at all. You really want to put relevant work experience to your course. So those, the major that is anything relevant to the major you're doing, especially if you're doing um, some sort of science program, if you've done any research, anything like that. If you work in English or history, have you, you know, interned anywhere within, within something like that. Um, and lastly, the personal statement. A personal statement is kind of, it's the UK's equivalent to our um, college essay. And what this is, is a way of talking about why you want to go to, to study this course in the UK. So it's your chance to kind of sell yourself to the university. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, and lastly, a reference is also required. This is something you'd have to get from your college counselor or a, a teacher who you, of the subject you're going to go to study. Um, so this is someone you really want who knows you well and they know what you're passionate about. You want them to um, be able to speak to your strengths and why you would be a good fit for any UK institution. All right, so here's just a little bit more about the personal statement. It gives you the option to tell universities and colleges why they want you as a student. Um, and it should really be unique, but as I mentioned, you want to really want to sell yourself. Some, some things that Americans tend to do in these personal statements is get a little bit too emotive. 
what British universities are looking for is students that are passionate about their course, their subject, but they don't necessarily want to know. If you were going to study English, they don't need to know that you played the trumpet for 10 years. They want to know that if you play the trumpet for 10 years, if while you're studying English, you're interested in studying the use of music and its history influencing English literature, something like that. As long as you can tie it to your course and something you want to study, put it in. If not, don't mention it. The people that are reading your personal statements, it's not always just the admissions tutor. It's oftentimes the professor or academic of your course. So they really want to see, once again, see that passion. Why should they choose you to fill a spot in their classroom? All right, so then after, after that, it comes time to decision making. Um, so institutions will make one of three decisions on your application, uh, unconditional offer, conditional offer, or unsuccessful. So an unconditional offer means you're accepted, you don't have to do anything else, just submit your final transcript to prove that you've graduated high school and you're good to go. Conditional offer says you'll be accepted on such and such condition. So if they, they might say, all right, we're looking, if you graduate with a 3.5 and you get you know, a four in this AP you're taking, you're accepted. That is often what they do. Most students get, get conditional offers, not unconditional offers. And then an unsuccessful, which means unfortunately you weren't accepted this round, you might be able to try again or really look into another university. So once you've gotten that final decision from the university, you are able to hold a maximum of two offers. So if you get an unconditional offer, I would say it's worth holding because you're accepted, you're good to go. Um, but if you get all conditional offers, it's worth it. You have to choose up to two. After that, you have to put the rest back. So you have to get rid of those applications um, and move on. So you'd have up to two, you can maintain up to two offers. So after that, all those extra applications that you submitted go back into the pool so another student might be able to be accepted. So then you yourself have, have a choice of three reply options. So you'd have a firm acceptance, an insurance acceptance, or you decline that offer. So once again, with declining that offer, you're putting it back in the pool for someone else. Your firm acceptance is, you want that to be your number one choice. So that is where you want to go. That is where you're gonna put your firm acceptance. Your insurance acceptance is really just a backup. So it's, it's kind of like a, a safety in a way. If you don't actually end up getting into your firm acceptance, because say on their, your conditional offer, you didn't, they said you needed you know, fives on two APs, and unfortunately you get a four and a five. They might still accept you, but they don't have to, because with a conditional offer, what they say is binding. If they say we, know, we need you know, two fives, if you get those two fives, you're automatically in, nothing to worry about. If you get that a four and a five, they don't have to accept you. They still might, but they don't, they're not required to. Um, so with that firm acceptance, you want that to be kind of your reach school. Your insurance accept acceptance should be your um, more of a safety, so somewhere you're confident that you can get in. So it's really a backup after your firm. All right, we're on to the next phrase. It's I'm absolutely gutted, and I am. I'm absolutely gutted because we'll I'll be leaving you soon. Um, the presentation is almost over, so thank you for your patience. Um, it's been really great to have everyone with me. Um, absolutely gutted. It's like um, I'm really. It's, I'm sad to see you go in a way. It's like you're absolutely gutted. It's like it hits. It's, it hits you hard right in the stomach. You're gutted. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about admissions requirements um, in order to, to enter a British institution. So typically universities are looking for advanced placements, uh, so AP classes or IB curriculum. This is not always the case, so if you're not one of them, don't worry about it, it's not a huge deal. They also look at dual enrollment, so say you're enrolled in high school, but also a community college or something, great. Um, internal honors programs may be considered. So if you're if you're on honors track within your high school, absolutely looks good. Um, sometimes universities look at SATs or ACTs, but they don't always require them. It might just be in addition to your application. Uh, but they all do require a high school diploma. Um, so those are just some of the academic requirements, and they all do vary on institution. So make sure you check the international page um, on the university's website you're interested in. After that, as I mentioned, you need that academic reference, which would come from your college counselor, your school counselor, or um, your teacher. So what they should be writing about is what a great student you are, obviously. Um, some information about your school. So say you don't have an IB curriculum or you don't have any APs when you're applying because your school doesn't offer them. Have them put that in there. The university should know that you've succeeded at your high school, given what you're actually 
able to do within, within that school system, and that's very important. Um, they should also provide contact to results. So if you have you know a drop in your sophomore year, something happened and your and your grades dip a little bit. If they can explain that, this is the time to do it. And then also they have to do grade predictions. And what grade predictions are are a way for the university. Um, it's basically your your counselor will say, all right, they'll likely get you know a four on this AP or a three on this AP. They'll you'll likely graduate with a three point five. And what we say is they, they sh their grade predictions should be what you're going to do on a good day. It shouldn't be you know a terrible day where you got no sleep or anything like that. It should be your, your typical um, performance on a good day. So really it should be very honest. If they, if they inflate your scores too much, your conditional offer might come through like, great, if you have a 3.3 and all of a sudden your teacher says you're going to have a 4.0, that might go into your conditional offer. They're going to want that 4.0 and if you don't meet it, you may have just hurt yourself in the long run. So honesty is key on the grade predictions. Okay, so funding. Tuition fees in the UK do vary pretty drastically, um, depending on the institution. So they can range between £7,000, which is about $11,000, up to £25,000, which is like $37,000, $38,000. So it can be quite a bit, but really they tend to be on, they average about £15,000, which is about $23,000. So they are, it's very affordable, and especially looking at U.S. institutions, which can be very expensive. And then you have to factor in living costs as well. So in the whole of the U.K., it's £800 per month that you must have for, you know, kind of room and board, and then £1,000 a month for in the London area because it is just so much more expensive there. Um, most of the British universities are FAFSA approved, so they can give out U.S. federal loans. They cannot give out federal aid. They can give out federal loans. Um, so that's something you have to pay back to the U.S. government, but it's a very slow interest rate, which is great. Um, and then other than that, you can take out private loans as well. There are some scholarships available to international students, but it depends on the university. Um, there will be more U.S. scholarships happening in the next few years as the British Council and the universities begin to partner a bit more together. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, under your visa, you can work part time, so you can add that factor that into your cost that you will be getting, you know, spending money while living in the UK because you can work. All right, so applying for a UK visa, I'm going to go through this very quickly because it is something that you won't have to do until at least the spring. Um, so with it, applying for a UK visa, you have to go to visas visa for UK.fco. .gov.uk and do the Tier 4 student. Um, so this, this application form is currently $477 um, and you have to get uh, send an envelope as well so they can send it back. After you um, kind of pay the visa fee, you will have to get your biometrics done. Uh, with that, that's your, your fingerprints. So once you get your fingerprints done, they'll actually take a copy of the online application form and they'll make sure that they get it right. Um, then you should submit your application after you get these. Then allow about 15 days for processing. I'm going to tell you what you actually need to submit because um, this is quite important. So some of the, the required documents are um, a passport. No surprise there. Of course, you need to submit your, your real passport. Do not submit a copy because you will be denied your visa. They need to be able to put this visa inside your current passport. A copy of your online application form. You will have submitted it, but send it in. And it, it, it helps speed along the process. A passport size photograph on a white background. White, white, white. Please put on a white background. If you don't, you will be rejected. So do it right from the get-go. Um, a passport size photo you can get at most um, local pharmacies, so make sure to check that out. Um, the VAF 9 Appendix 8 form for the Tier 4 student. So um, just another one of the forms for the visa. And lastly, your CAS number, your Certificate of Acceptance for Studies. and. What this is, is a means, so it's the way for the, the government and the universities to track you. So your university you choose to go to will actually send you your CAS number. So you will receive that from the university, it'll say it right there, and you have to put that on your form. Without a CAS number, you cannot receive a student visa because you're, the university is actually um, sponsoring you to be in the country. So you really need to have that with, submit that with your application to be successful in your, in your visa process. All right, so now that you've gotten your visa, you've been accepted to an institution, you're all ready to go, 
you're gonna arrive in you know possibly you know London Heathrow and Manchester and Edinburgh and Glasgow and Belfast I don't know depending on where you're going um, and then you're gonna say something like nasty Q in it because um, border control can have a nasty Q um, meaning the line can be a bit long um, however in it meaning isn't it um, but it's something you might hear while you're waiting. It's nasty Q in it. Um, and this can be all over the UK. As you well know, I'm sure, the Brit Brits are known for their ability to queue and their patience. Um, so you might find that once you arrive in the country, you might wake in a little bit of a queue, but it is totally worth it because you will definitely have the adventure of a lifetime, believe me. All right, so that's the end of what I'm really going to say about the UK itself. Um, if you have any questions, I put my information up on the screen now, and the website I've mentioned earlier is educationuk.org. That's what you need to check out, slash USA, to get some real US focus. Um, my name's Joey Kirk. Once again, I'm the Education Officer at the British Council um, here in Washington, D.C., based out of the British Embassy. And my email is joseph.kirk, K-I-R-K, at britishcouncil.org. Now we have one more phrase, so I'm going to jump right into that, which is... Cheers, ta. Uh, cheers meaning, you know, something along the lines of thank you and ta as well. So ta, cheers. I really do appreciate everyone um, coming out today and, and sticking with me through the presentation. If you have any questions, now's the time to um, put them out there. If not, I, I'll just think I uh, answered all of them throughout because I know it was quite the thorough presentation. Um, so cheers, everyone. I do appreciate your attendance. And I'll have to just end with, that's Great Britain. So this is the UK, and that's Great Britain. You would absolutely enjoy studying there, and I can really guarantee you a lovely time with some wonderful, wonderful people where you'll get to use some pretty, pretty great phrases. So let's just go through them once more. You all right? Brilliant. I'm absolutely chuffed. All right, let's have a think. It's a bit wonky. Uh, that's ace. That's rubbish. Don't have a strop. I'm absolutely gutted to leave you. Nasty cue in it. And cheers. Ta. So once again, guys, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And um, have a lovely day. All right. Thank you. Bye.